To hear more about the libraries, please visit our website at library.unc.edu. And if you're into Twitter, you can visit us on Twitter at UNC Library. And uh, but before we start, I have a lot of thank yous that I need to push out there. Uh, first, I'd like to thank all the presenters this evening. Um, we're really looking forward to hearing you read the amazing work that you have produced. I'd like to thank Blair Publishing. And I'd also like to thank uh, UNC Chapel Hill's School of Information and Library Science. So I'm gonna turn it over now to Bob Anthony, who's the curator of the North Carolina Collection at Wilson Special Collections Library. And Bob is going to introduce our program as well as our authors. Bob? Uh, good evening. I want to join Elaine in welcoming you to our program tonight. Uh, this is a special occasion, uh, so special that for only the second time since last March, I have put on a necktie. Um, please note that it's color. Uh, my, my image doesn't look real good to me here, so I don't know if you can see color, but it is Carolina blue and white. You'll, you'll learn in a few minutes of the importance of that. We're uh, gathering, as, as Elaine said, to mark the publication of an important and impressive new book, uh, a contribution to the, a major contribution to the literature of our state and our region. Uh, this book, and we'll show you the cover several times tonight, all the songs we sing, uh, is published by Blair, an imprint of Carolina Wren Press. It is edited by Leonard Moore, and I'm hoping that Leonard is with us tonight. He's not part of the program, but he was the inspiration behind the Carolina African American Writings, uh, Writers Collective and the editor of this book. Uh, a uh, preface or foreword is by our poet laureate, Jackie Shelton Green. Uh, Green. I think many of you have heard her read. She's read for programs in the library uh, recently. We're going to be hearing readings from four of 41 contributors to this volume. Uh, it is a volume that includes poetry, fiction, and nonfiction, and it is well worth your spending some time with it. I have enjoyed it very much uh, in the last uh, a week since I have had a copy. Uh, tonight, as I mentioned, we've got four contributors who will be reading from their works. Now, in 1839, 182 years ago, a new book was published uh, in Raleigh uh, it was entitled Attempts at Rhyming. It does not bear an author's name. It is simply attributed to an old field teacher, an apparent reference to the poet being a teacher in a small school located in an old field or an abandoned field that was no longer fertile. In the mid 20th century, the identity of that poet was finally discovered. It turned out he was an Englishman named Alban Hart, who was director of a school in rural Warren County. Hart included in his book one poem entitled On Chapel Hill, the first verse of which reads, wood crested hills and verdant vales among, see Northern Carolina's learned retreat, where arts and letters and the poet's song adorn with majesty the muse's seat. We're pleased to brag that each of tonight's readers has spent or is currently spending time at Carolina and hope that their communing with the muses uh, here at this learned retreat has been time well spent. I think that their contributions to all the songs we uh, sing show that it was. Now for our first reader. Uh, Raina J. Leon, PhD, is Black, Afro-Puerto Rican, and from Philadelphia. She is the author of three books of poetry, uh, Cantle of Idols, Boogeyman Dawn, Sombra Dislocate, and two chat books. She is the founder of the Asantos Review, a journal focused on Latinx writers and of StoryJoy, Inc., a consultancy for Black and Indigenous uh, people of color, uh, creatives, and human services provider. I learned a few minutes ago that while she was enrolled in Chapel Hill, she worked in our Stone Center Library. So we'll now hear from her. It is such a delight to be with you and to have my daughter here with me as well. Um, I'm so grateful to Lenard for, for this initial spark and for this gathering of people who um, are holding space for us. So two poems. Poet, Code Story. You think it is so distant, the lynching. 
What to make of the story my mother told in the car on the way to my wedding. How there was a boy who liked her, came calling round and said, what would they do if we went to prom together? The white boy asked, she said, you might live, but me, they'd find in a ditch. Because that's what happened to one black boy who went calling round a pretty white girl. The folks warned her, they warned him, but lo young in love, defiant, all that high in the mountains, what screams to not hear, they found him in a ditch. But her, she didn't come back to town, but live. And not so far in time more recent still, the Moroccan boy on the edge of manhood, by the side of the road between Pennsylvania and Ohio, a group of us, had just returned from a conference on race and organizing and social action, hopeful, not on guard, must be 14 years now. We got lost. He turned around in the wrong gravel driveway. The man came with his gun, called the police. We saw it, that rifle on a brown leather seat. Manuel, he held his hands out front still, only reached for his wallet when the officer said, and slow from a distance, my friend David, so black and proud, and young went mad. We had to hold him back. So many hands, it's not right. It's not right and still. That officer made Manuel go back to the gravel, rake it level with bare hands. That rifle was there while whiteness watched, while we in the next van watched just to know he would leave alive. And on the day of my wedding, on the way to marry an Italian man, my mother told a story I had heard before. A lesson was that ditch still yawning. And then a month later when we went bowling, the mountain alley, what more to do? How love noticed the whiteness, all the whiteness whispered in my ear, so white. And I said, you notice, but I feel in my family, we've been here for 200 years in him. But remember, I'm the foreigner. And so we too found the lighter fall, not skilled. It was a turbulent brown. We held and aimed and let go, not skilled. So many gutters waiting next to us, a couple with a toddler. I smiled because children, she smiled back, but him, not one word. While he launched his green against the raised guards set to guide his son's way. I offer that initial poem to frame us because our collective is fearless and fearless in their confrontation, our confrontation of the ills with the hope of transformation often. So this last poem, Iset, God and Mother. All names existed within my mother, but I cannot remember hers, it was sacred like red mud slathered over the shaved scalp after the rains and acacia flowers, the signs of girls blooming. My mother materials for dung, heap, soil, water, thatch, home in the rooms of our place. We gathered the dying over fire and smoked herbs from that womb to the other place that calls the eyes as crossing sign. Mother taught me to breathe, life, is to incense to burn, death is to ember, or reversed, I have forgotten the song. I never heard a care or smelled sweetness, unspoken symbiotic cycle, why doesn't my daughter know this too? Warmth that radiated from leather cracked hands, how entangled her name is with vain, sacred needs, no memory to be, the spirits enveloped, filled, godded me up and through, but how to be a mother? and mother to a God, when I cannot remember my own mother's name, but I see her life on my hands in all water, every drop of rain. Thank you very much. We thank you, Raina. Several years ago, I might have introduced our next reader as an old friend, but I introduced informally one friend to another a few years ago as an old friend and was told that the better way to describe it is a friend of long standing. Dr. L. Uh, Teresa Church is a friend of long standing. She's been a member of the Carolina African American Writers Collective since 1995. 
Her writings have appeared in publications as simply Haku, The Heron's, List, uh, Heron's Nest, Obsidian, Literature in the African Diaspora, Solo Cafe, Nocturnes, Review of the, Liberal, of the Literary Arts, African American Review, North Carolina Literary Review, and One Window's Light, a collection of haiku, as well as her chapbooks, Hand Me Down Calicos and Beyond the Water Dance. During 1996, Dr. Church or uh, Teresa Church enrolled in the School of Information and Library Science at UNC Chapel Hill. She earned her MLS degree or MSLS degree in 1998 and in 2008 earned her PhD in Information and Library Science. Dr. Church. Good evening and thank you. Let me first begin by saying a special thank you to the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill Libraries the School of Information and Library Science and Blair Publishing. I thank everyone who has taken the time this, after, this evening to join us for this special occasion as we uh, read from all the songs we sing. The first poem that I will read is The Moment at Hand. I would like to read it first and then give you a bit of information afterwards as to what inspired this piece. This particular poem is written in a format called A Minute. The moment at hand. Michelle Obama's green gloved hands cradle Lincoln's red case Bible this winter day. On the Capitol's west front steps, we watch her grace, esteem her style. First brown lady. Her grasp pedestals this moment when Barack's palm presses his stance indelible. This poem was inspired following the election of President Barack Obama and the founder and executive director of our writers group, Leonard D. Moore inspired us and challenged us to experiment with this poem called A Minute, the format. And this is the poem that I came up with. Of course, being guided with the prompts to use something about the 2008 election in the poem. That was that poem. The second poem I want to read is called Woman Child. And this will give you a sense of my upbringing as a child in rural Virginia and some of the things that shaped my life. Woman Child. For the last 24 months, more woman than child. Her ninth summer stretches the shadow of dolls Beyond plank bottom swing, she sets two year old brother on her hip. Like a steel trap, she grasped little sister's thumb suck hand. Six days a week, seven when needed, she be her mama's stand in mama. Woman child hauls water buckets. Woman child bends over wash tub. Woman child rings mop strings. Woman child cooks, stirs cook stove pots. Woman child gazes past clothes on a wire line. Longs to be more child than woman. And my last selection from all the songs we sing are haiku, which I have been writing now for about 12 years and feeling really like this is my go-to format when I'm on the road. Some of the poems that I'm going to read in this selection of haiku document my travels in the South, particularly in Tennessee and Mississippi, as well as here at home. They read as follows. Sliver of moonlight stretches across the bed, my husband's snore. Sliver of moonlight stretches across the bed. My husband snore. Rose laying at Alex Haley's tomb, a rooster crows. Rose laying at Alex Haley's tomb, a rooster crows. Springtime farewell. B.B. King's processional rolls down Beale Street. 
Springtime farewell. B.B. King's processional rolls down Beale Street. Navy blue hearse hauls the blues man home. A mosquito sings. Navy blue hearse hauls the blues man home. A mosquito sings. Wild onions, we watch cows chew their cud. Wild onions, we watch cows chew their cud. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Church. Malayla Mungal is uh, also a graduate of UNC Chapel Hill School of Information and Library Science. Though she considered becoming a reference librarian during her internship at Duke's Perkins Library, she found her calling in school librarianship. She was fortunate enough to study with Dr. Barbara Moran and Dr. Evelyn Daniel at Sills and went on to open the first joint public school library in Carborough at McDougal Middle School. Elena has authored a number of short stories and biographies for youth, including The Vast Wonder of the World, biologist Ernest Everett Just, winner of the Carter G. Woodson Award, her newest book is a picture book for young readers called Jaden's Impossible Garden, winner of the first Strive African American Voices Award. It will be published in March. Thank you very much for that intro. And like the other readers before me, I really wanna thank uh, UNC Chapel Hill for putting on this event and inviting us here to do this reading. I also really want to thank the founders of the Carolina African American Writers Collective, especially Leonard Moore and Teresa Church, who really welcomed me into the group and um, helped me get that start into my writing that I really needed at that time. Tonight, I'm going to share a short story I wrote that's in the collection. It's called On the Border. And this is based on an actual event that actually happened. First time I saw it, I knew right away it was hurt, else it would have flown away like any other sensible bird when it seen me coming with the hoe. It fluttered and cowered in the corner of the garden in between the rolls of hoe beans. Probably fell out of the tree like so many baby birds come springtime. I didn't see a nest in the sweet gum behind the fence. I would have noticed it. The bird was squat and black like a lump of furry fat. It looked like some kind of duck, but I couldn't tell for sure. Its tiny tail feathers was caked with mud. Dark marble eyes stared at me. Could it smell the chicken fat, liver parts, bone bits, and blood sunk into my skin from years coating my smock? It had been so bad when I'd started at the Royal Poultry Emporium, couldn't nothing take the smell away. No matter what I tried, Jovan musk, coconut oil, even Frank's aftershave, I still smelled that raw, bloody chicken as I drove back across the border to South Carolina every night with Aunt Della and Cheryl Caldwell. After a few years, couldn't notice the difference no more, but everyone outside the plant could. It tore me apart to see my own baby girl shrivel and cry whenever I came near because of the smell. Seemed like she only let Frank hold her and give her the bottle. Maybe if I just fed her on my own milk, she'd be alive today. Preemie's better off on formula, they'd said. But maybe she could have gotten used to my smell. After all, Frank did. Wasn't the smile drove him away, it was the operation. After they cut my baby girl out, they cut out my womb to save my life, they said. I raised the hoe, wondering if there would be a sound as it came down across that feathery skull. I didn't need no bird getting into my vegetables, especially since I had to live off of them now. The company had barely paid my medical bills and the court said the state didn't need to pay nothing even though they had never inspected that poultry pit. Not once. I needed the money, but Lucifer's servants couldn't drag me back to a place like that again. Didn't never wanna to touch no more meat, no matter how it was cooked. Couldn't stand to think about that frying in hot oil, boiling, barbecuing. Hellish flames burning and tearing at flesh, burning screams and dreams right off the bone, fire trapping and slapping bodies into a smoldering ooze. 
I looked down at the dirty lump staring at me. Was it a haint come from the bloody ashes to get me? Had to get rid of that bird, that nasty, smelly bird. I could still smell it like it was just yesterday, stinking up my hair, my skin, my air. From where I'd stood near the front entrance, I heard the rush of gas as it lit a wall of fire around us, heard the fire killing screams, pushed and ran and ran, hot, hot, black smoke, frying flesh, screaming, screaming, screaming. Donna Bass Knight, Cheryl Caldwell, Vonda True Love, Laquita Farrington, Annie Gibbs, burning at the door marked fire, exit only. I saw them pounding, faces twisted and trapped from where I crawled outside. Smoky mess, couldn't open the door for them. Blocked, my arms still on fire as I looked down. That bird stared up at me, glassy black eyes accusing. Why me? I studied the hoe before my shaking arms and raised it again like a pickaxe. Had to get rid of that stinky bird. No more fowl, no more feathers, no more flesh. The bird inched away toward the fence, toward the ashes of the royal poultry emporium. Fly, darn it, why can't you fly, you devil bird? I closed my eyes and with all my strength brought the hoe down. The sound of screaming filled my ears. Stop, stop the screaming. I brought the hoe down again and again, my eyes closed tighter to block out the cries. All I saw was black smoke. Run, run, keep running, stop, stop the screaming, stop. I'd run clear across the field and was next to the highway. I leaned on the signpost to steady myself and catch my breath. Then I read the sign, adopt a highway. This portion of 177 adopted by Mason Hog Farms. The oatmeal I'd eaten for breakfast lurched up and out. I stood there until a car horn honked at me. My sister's brown Dodge pickup stopped in the middle of the road. Marilyn, what you doing here? Sandra's soft voice coated me as she touched my arm. Just taking a walk, that's all. I knew what she was thinking. You never go nowhere. You're afraid to leave the yard. But I couldn't tell her what I was really afraid of. I got in the truck with her and she drove me back home. After they released me from that burn center in Charlotte, Sandra let me stay in Michael's room since he'd gone to the Marines. But my nephew's room was right next to the kitchen. I couldn't live that close to those smells. So Sandra's husband fix, fixed up the old shed for me. I went right there and stayed the rest of the day reading my burpee seed catalog. Next morning, I went back out to the garden. The hoe lay in the dirt next to five deep gashes where the blade had landed. I stopped to pick it up so I could get back to my work. Felt like Grandpa Cheney, the way he used to bend to pick the beans and potatoes he'd planted earlier. That's all I wanna do, dig, plant, grow. Like Grandma Cheney too, used to snap beans as fast as she knit, snap, plink, snap, plink, as she dropped the beans in a bucket in summer. Click, click, clack, winter needles connected in winter. And every so often, she'd grab a chicken from the yard and twist and snap. I heard a rustling in the dirt. I looked over and those hard, wet eyes looked back up at me. Birds don't blink, but I thought it was dead. Should have been. The bird looked at the same as I left it, a muddy black blob. Could have been a lump of dirt. Maybe it was. I closed my eyes tight and counted to 10. When I opened them, the lump was still there and it moved. I backed away and kept walking until I reached my little house. I was shaking when I lay down on my cot, that damn bird, fixing to eat up my sidling, seedlings sent here to scare me. I sat straight up again. No, no haint or bird or nothing was going to ruin my garden. I went back out to the far side and worked on my flower beds, tulips, daffodils, and iris about to bloom. This was my garden. No matter whose land it was on, I worked it, watered it, cared for it. I lay down in it next morning before the sun come up. I felt all misty and cool and new, like the morning glories before they open up to the day. Like the deep purple pansies shining with dew, I pretended to be one of them with fresh new skin. Velvety soft and smooth, so smooth you wanna lay your face next to one and breathe pure sweetness. After the sun come up, I got my tools and returned to the vegetable side of the garden. I inched closer to the bean patch, but I was going to work on the peas first. My fingers sunk into the damp black dirt. It felt good not to feel pain no more. I saw a flutter in the corner of my eye, but didn't want to turn. I kept playing with the dirt, letting it sift through my fingers. 
I heard a tiny sound from the bean patch. I didn't want to see nothing except dirt and seedlings, but I saw the bird. It was still a dirty black lump. Its head lurched forward and grabbed a thick gray-brown worm. It snapped its beak and swallowed. The bird's skinny throat bulked where the worm got sucked down. My hands were shaking. This bird wouldn't die. I backed up and ran to Sandra's house. Had to do something clean, had to do laundry. I threw all their clothes from the basket into the washing machine, then ran across the yard to get all of my clothes. I did four loads and hung each batch to dry outside. The next day, I went to weed near the turnips and collards. The ground was still wet from rain and the plants looked all clean and green. I smiled at them. Then I stole a peek at the bean patch. The bird was still there, but farther away this time, and it looked different. I walked over the bird and saw its shiny tail feathers. The rain must have washed all the dirt off. I moved in and looked at it even closer. It shivered. I saw myself in its mirror eyes, a hulking creature with stained and stretched skin holding a hoe in her hands. Water leaked in through the door when it stormed that night. I cut out the light and stuck my toes in the cool puddle. I watched out the window as thousands of droplets fell from the sky. A rain parade showered my flowers and vegetables like confetti in those New York parades on TV. A flash of lightning lit up a corner of the garden and I smiled at how pretty and silver it looked. But I jumped when a clap of thunder struck real close. I couldn't stop shaking after that. Why couldn't it have rained the day of the fire? Water would have poured over the flames, dousing them quick. Another bolt of lightning flashed and thunder crashed again, even closer. Why did it have to happen? Lightning lit the bean patch before me and I strained to see from my window that bird would be pelted out there if it was still alive. Seconds later, I was out in the garden, sloshing around in it, looking for the bird. Rain washed over me, soaked through me, seeped into me. I nearly stepped on it as the bird tried to hide under new tomato plants. I scooped it up and it pecked at me, but I ran all the way back to my little house with it. I dried it with my towel and set it down on the braided rug next to my cot. It sat there still shaking, looking all around. After I dried myself and changed, I stepped over it to my bed. I lay there looking at that shiny black mess of feathers. It smelled just like me, wet and muddy. I didn't get up for my morning walk on the flowers like usual. I was too afraid of stepping on the bird in the darkness. So I lay there until the sun poked in through the windows. The bird didn't move when I stepped over it to get breakfast. I bent down and touched it, thinking it might be dead. Its eyes opened, but this time it didn't shake or flutter away from me or try to peck. I stroked the back of its neck and was surprised at how soft it felt, like a kitten. After making toast for myself, I crumpled up another piece and put it outside my door for the bird. If I just fed it a little and looked after it for a while, it would fly off on its own when I could. I went to the bee patch right away after that and worked all the rows of vegetables. A week passed before Pansy walked without looking like she'd topple over. I'd started feeding her corn and cereal and other scraps. She loved them and her feathers looked silkier and shinier than I ever guessed they could. I still hadn't figured out what kind of bird she was. She had to have some kind of, be some kind of special duck. When the mailman came around to my little house, I was holding Pans in my lap, stroking her sleek feathers. He held out the white envelope and I took it with my left hand. Got yourself a new bird there, Ms. Marilyn. Just nursing it till it can fly again. You know, chickens don't fly much. That's a bantam. My brother raises them. He ticked me off when he started laughing, so I didn't answer. I looked at the envelope. It was from Cameron, Tate, and Howell, lawyers for the plant. I knew from the size of it, it couldn't be a check. So I set it down and stroked Pansy with both hands. I heard a cheer, 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 and saw a red bird land in the sweet gum. I blew it a kiss. And that's the end. Thank you. We thank you. Our fourth reader, Ashley Harris, is a biomedical sciences graduate student and poet who has an interest in medicine. She's published a short story, Black Wall Street, in both Spanish and English in the online magazine, uh, Anguas de Paso. 
Her poetry book, If the Hero of Time Was Black, was published in 2018 by Weasel Press. She has poems in Cartridge Lit, Yellow Chair Review, and Wuss Good. Ashley. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Ashley Harris, and I would just like to say that all the songs we sing is a great collection of work um, with different varieties of writing. Um, and it proves that Black people are not a monolith, that Black writers are not a monolith, and that we all have a different story and a different poem that needs to be shared and needs to be read. And I'm thankful for the Carolina African American Writers Collective. Um, I'm thankful to Dr. Teresa Church, Dr. Leonard Moore, Gideon Young, Fred Joyner, everybody. I'm thankful for all of them because they helped me stay on track with my writing because I am a, also a science person. And so I'm grateful for them. So I'm going to read two poems from the book all the songs we sing. And the first poem is called Pictograph Selfie and it's, it reflects on police brutality. The Pictograph Selfie. They say, Ash, you are the youngest looking one in the picture. And I hope my body hasn't learned to prolong youthfulness and fear that tomorrow will be its funeral that my face wants to live each day like yesterday in case I die at dawn or dusk, that it was made to convince officers that I am innocent. My youthfulness must be a genetic adaptation, what humans change in themselves to survive over time. I smile, that my armor has become so appealing, but still not good enough to distract death at the next traffic stop. So the next poem is a link between worlds. And all these poems are related to the Legend of Zelda because I like the Legend of Zelda, but also they hit on important topics. This poem is about graduating from college and realizing that, you know, it's not what you thought it was, especially coming from poverty. A Link Between Worlds. A Link Between Worlds is a Black girl who just got a full scholarship to a prestigious or predominantly white college and must travel between her granny's trailer house and her dorm on North Campus. It isn't bad at first. The freshman dorms resemble the second place she lived in her life, a homeless shelter with brick walls and plastic mattresses, but then it gets harder to transition and she can't understand her granny's quick switch lips as well, thinks she is too bougie to wash in molecule-sized buckets, and cannot cope with her mother's constant bickering <clears throat> about never having money or losing her job last weekend. She will be the link that others use to question why her kind cannot cross over, but when she graduates, it will be hard for her to cross over into the job market because she fought hard, but not twice as hard. She thought herself a bridge to others, but found herself burning it when she thought it became too dirty. Now the link is herself and that soon might sever. There is no way to balance her past to the present. There is no way even with a link to this other world to predict her future. If she progresses forward, her family can't go with her until she reaches the end and then she might not even be herself. Escaping poverty is an out of body experience and those left behind are the body in the coffin. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, all four of our readers. Very, very much appreciated. A very impressive reading from a very impressive book. We do have a few minutes if you, any of our viewers tonight, 
would like to pose some questions to our readers, you can do so through the chat link that uh, the chat function at the bottom of your screen. Um, I hope we will hear from uh, some of you, your response to these readers that we have been fortunate to have had with us tonight. I see a question that has been presented for me. How can people join in the next anthology? My goodness, I'm honored and I'm flattered that you're already talking about the next anthology. We don't know when that will happen, but as prolifically as we are writing, I'm certainly believing that it will come to pass. Members of the Carolina African American Writers Collective will certainly be sought after, challenged, harassed, if you will, to submit good writing, which is always good from them. And if people are interested in joining the collective, please visit the CAAWC website and find out how to contact me through the website. And I can tell you how to go about joining the organization if you choose to do that. But other than that, look for us wherever you find us. Keep an eye out for us, keep an ear out for us and encourage us as I encourage my fellow writers in the group to write, write, write. If life keeps going forward, I'm sure we will have no shortage of great things to talk about. We'll have no shortage of things to comment about and we will write. We will let you know when the next anthology comes. But as I say, keep an eye out for us, keep an ear out for us, and we will promise not to disappoint you. Thank you for the question. We've had several uh, questions and comments. Um, Sabrina uh, Ortiz, the uh, Daily Tar Heel reporter, has, has asked the question, what are your hopes for reaction readers will have when reading or hearing your work? What are your hopes for reactions from readers who are reading your work? Since I'm already logged on and unmuted, I will attempt to answer that question as to what I hope that readers will get from hearing my work. And as a matter of fact, I would like to speak not just for me, but for all of the voices that are singing so beautifully and harmoniously in this collection. I hope that readers will take from this Book, and I do encourage everyone that if you haven't gotten a copy to purchase a copy, but know that there are writers who have been in the field, as we call it, laboring with words and seeking publication opportunities down through the years. We are new voices, some of us. We are now seasoned voices, many of us. We have something to say about African-American life and culture as we, as we see it. And we just feel charged to leave a record that we were here. One of the ways we can do that is with this book. This book very much reminds me of a collection unto itself. It is a collection of writings and a collection of voices and writers who were here in 1995, before 1995, we're here now. We look forward as we go into the future to being here to continue to write but know that you can find this collection of African-American voices in North Carolina in all the songs we sing. We believe that we are soloists. We believe that we are quartets. We believe that we are choirs of the word and we are courageous, courageous enough to sing. We say, join us. If you do nothing else, pat your foot to the song. Say amen if you agree to what we have sung but buy the book and know that we love writing because we have something that we want to share with everyone who wants to read what we have to say. Uh, Raina has had to leave us to teach a class. Um, so um, we, we very much appreciate her having been with us. We are getting some additional questions. Um, one is what are some of your favorite or inspirational poets? Many years ago, I was inspired to find Gwendolyn Brooks. And as an emerging writer in an undergraduate degree program, I had scribbled some poems and they were some poems that I obviously should not have shared, but you don't get to be known by hiding your work. 
and I reached out to Gwendolyn Brooks and she wrote back and gave me encouragement. I've written, have read the poetry of Michael Harper. I've read the poetry of so many great writers, Maya Angelou and others. And I was just made to believe and understand the power of words and that we as writers have something to say. And I wanted to be no less appreciative for the opportunity for a listening ear than any of the poets I, whom I have mentioned and others who are too numerous to mention. It's just- Malena? Okay. I was gonna ask Malena and Ashley, do they have a favorite or a particular inspirational poets? I am actually going to echo some of what um, Dr. Church said. She mentioned Maya Angelou, who was someone who really inspired me when I was younger. Um, Langston Hughes, some of the classic poets. Um, Janice Harrington is someone who really inspires me now, who writes for adults as well as children. Um, there are poets like Nikki Finney, who was part of the collective. And... Um, other poets like Sandra Cisneros and Bao Fi, there are so many. Um, I've been inspired by other members of our collective um, who continue to inspire as well. I would say um, I love Nikki Fenny. That was probably, she was probably one of the first like black poets besides Langston Hughes that I was introdu introduced to in undergrad at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, I like Gwendolyn Brooks as well. And I read so many different poets, but I would say those are the ones that come to mind at the top for me. Okay. You have some fans tonight who are asking, will there be future? collective readings. Absolutely. Absolutely, there will be future readings. What I will simply say, we have book, we have poems, we have stories, we have essays, we will travel, invite us. We will be delighted to come. What would be a good way for people to learn of those readings? We will uh, post information on the CAAWC website. The Carolina African American Writers Collective's website is where everyone can go to learn more about what we're doing, where we're going to be reading, when we're going to be reading, dates and times. Okay, we have a, a, another a comment and question. I realize each writer is unique in style, but how were the various uh, writers selected to create a harmonious thread that complements each other? Among the writers, that, among the writers yeah. that we have in the collective, there are over the years at least seventy have joined, and they have ranged in age from the, from as young as fifteen to seventy. And with the meetings that we have held over the years, we have been exposed to all of these great writings. So the selection of poets was not hard. The selection of fiction writers was not hard. The selection of nonfiction writers was not hard. They were all there. And I credit the vision for this wonderful anthology, all the songs we sing to the founder and executive director of the Carolina African American Writers Collective, Leonard D. Moore. Okay. We've had a question about how you can purchase a copy of the book. Uh, one can of course go to Blair Publishing's online uh, site. You can also go to bookshop.org or uh, I know there were several copies at the uh, uh, UNC Chapel Hill uh, bookstore, the Bull's Head, when I was over there the other day, uh, you could ask in your local bookstore. And if they don't have it in stock, you could encourage them to do so. And then perhaps your, your local library would have a copy or you could encourage the staff there to, to order copies that way. But the book, the book uh, is available for acquisition or perhaps borrowing from libraries. Also, please feel free to go to the Blair Publishing's website and order online and you can get your book ordered that way and shipped to you in the mail. And we would be very happy to know that we're represented in all the homes and on all the bookshelves and all the libraries that would like to have a little music. We'll be happy to sing on the shelf for you. 
Okay, you've, you've had a question as to whether you would do a Zoom class on poetry and your writing for a fourth grade class in Winston-Salem. Um, I'm assuming uh, maybe there's a way to communicate with the collective through uh, its website. Um, would that be the best way? That is correct. Contact us through the website. Okay. Okay. If there are no further questions or comments from our, our, our program attendees, um, first, we want to thank the attendees for joining us tonight. I think you will agree it was well, well worth your time. And we want to say a special thank you, special thank you to our four program participants, uh, very talented writers who have shared their work along with 37 other writers in this book, all the songs we sing, and I, I assure you, if you get it and read it, you will be impressed. Thank you for joining us tonight. Now the library, university libraries will have other programs um, for the next several months. You can find out about that on the university library's website. And uh, we uh, very much appreciate you being with us tonight and all have a good evening. Thank you again, readers. Thank you. Thank you.